Welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations, where we talk about hot topic issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Today we're going to talk about Kashmir, a land that covers 86,000 square miles and is home to approximately 14 million people. It is claimed by both India and Pakistan, and the two nuclear-armed neighbors have fought multiple wars over the region. Pakistan controls one-third of the territory, and India administers two-thirds of Kashmir. These two territories are divided along a de facto border called the Line of Control. Over the past 30 years, there has been a separatist movement in Indian-administered Kashmir that has sought independence from Indian rule and has often turned violent. India has responded by using preponderant military force and engaging in gross human rights violations. More than 70,000 people have died in the conflict and tens and thousands of more have been either maimed or have been disappeared by the Indian state. Kashmir was most recently in the news when in August 2019, India revoked Article 370 of the Constitution, which over the past 70 years had given some semblance of autonomy to people in Indian administered Kashmir. With this move, India brought Kashmir under its direct rule and imposed a communication and security lockdown that further exacerbated the humanitarian situation there. Today, we're going to talk about developments in Kashmir since August 5th and also about what lies ahead. Often, the discourse surrounding Kashmir is dominated by narratives propagated by either India or Pakistan. Today, we're going to talk about Kashmir its history, the conflict, and aspirations of the Kashmiri people purely from a Kashmiri perspective. To help us understand that, we are very fortunate to be joined by Professor Muhammad Junaid, who is a Kashmiri scholar, an activist, and also a cultural anthropologist. He's also assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. Professor Junaid, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here. So let's begin by, um, could you give us a brief overview of Kashmir's history after British colonial rule ended in the Indian subcontinent in 1947? Um, so to understand the post-1947 Kashmir, we have to really go back a little bit uh, into the history. Mm -hmm. um, Kashmir, uh, as you know, is this um, Himalayan region, a huge uh, country. Uh, for centuries before 1947, Kashmiris have imagined um, that place as uh, a country. Um, in, in Urdu, in Kashmiri, they use the term mulk, mm. or mulki Kashmir, which is the country of Kashmir. Sure. Um, it is a land of uh, multi-ethnic, um, multilinguistic, multi-religious uh, communities, um, has gone through um, a variety of kingdoms and been part of empires, but Throughout most of its history, it has been a kind of independent, uh, semi-independent, or an autonomous region. Mm -hmm. Even until 1947, um, Kashmir was uh, a semi-independent region. It was um, controlled by, uh, ruled by the Dogras, um, uh, who had been given this territory uh, in lieu of their support to the British in their war against the Sikhs in 1846. Mm -hmm. um, and from 1846 to 1947, um, the Dogras ruled Kashmir. Um, and this was a Hindu dynasty? Dogras were a Hindu dynasty, but the majority of the subjects of this uh, kingdom were Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, you know, un in 1947, until 1947, uh, more than 70% of the population was Muslim, uh, and 25%, um, 28% were Hindus, uh, and 3% were Sikhs. Uh, but the rulers were Hindus. Mm -hmm. In 1947, when the British left the subcontinent, um, as you know, the partition took place. Before the partition, there was a cabinet mission uh, which uh, basically uh, told the Indian, uh, uh, you know, the, the princely states, and Kashmir was one of them, to either join India or Pakistan or decide to remain independent. Mm -hmm. And in 1947, um, uh, Kashmiris uh, uh, did not know whether, uh, they did not know that they would have to make that choice. Mm -hmm. Since 1931, there had been a mass uprising against the Dogra ruler because he, uh, the Dogras were a feudal monarchy, uh, heavily taxing the Kashmiri Muslim peasants mm -hmm. uh, and artisanal classes. 
And so there had been um, a mass uprising for equality, justice, democracy, right, you know, uh, uh, citizenship. And on the borders, there were, had been like uprisings um, to secede from the Dogras. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1947, when this moment arose, which Kashmiris hadn't imagined, they thought their mass mobilization was primarily against the, the Dogras. It was not an anti-colonial movement, although mm -hmm. Kashmiris did express solidarity with anti-colonial struggles in South Asia. Sure. Um, for them, uh, it was primarily seeking equality in the this Mulki Kashmir, in this country of Kashmir. Right. And in 1944, uh, there was a Naya Kashmir document, which was a very progressive um, document adopted by the prominent Kashmiri political party at that time, National Conference, which envisaged um, an independent, democratic, even socialist republic of Kashmir. Sure. Um, and Kashmir had, uh, although there, there was national conference, there were multiple other political parties. So it was a pluralistic region with dynamic politics, with um, diversity of thought. Um, in 1947, the Maharaja of Kashmir dithered. He delayed whether to join India or Pakistan or to declare independence. So at the time when, in August 1947, when both India and Pakistan were established and created as independent entities, by then the Dogra had not uh, ruler had not yet decided whether he was going to accede to India or Pakistan or remain independent. Exactly. And in August uh, 1947, he did sign a standstill agreement with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, he s sent a similar standstill agreement to India, which did not uh, sign it. Uh, and the standstill agreement basically said that relations will continue, the status quo will continue until they reach an uh, a decision about wh what they wanted to do. With. Yes, and standstill agreement principally was designed to allow the rulers time to decide what they wanted to do. Right. I mean, and they had to make this decision based on the composition of their po population and the geographical contiguity of their borders. Sure. In Kashmir, the majority population was Muslim and its geographical contiguity was with Pakistan. Yeah. Its reverse, its uh, roads, and its uh, you know cultural ties kind of flowed westward sure. not southward southward there were mountains mm -hmm. you know high mountains there were no roads mm -hmm. um, and in uh, August 1947 the Maharajas um, you know backers in his southern province of Jammu which was uh, rule uh, which was basically um, a fiefdom of the upper caste Hindus um, they started massacring Muslims from the region driving them out uh, thinking that eventually when the moment comes uh, uh, like Pakistan might take over Kashmir, we must, uh, you know, keep Jammu for India. I see. And so from August 1947 to mid-1948, there's this process of ethnic cleansing that goes on in Jammu. Um, it, Jammu city, for instance, used to be a Muslim-majority city. Mm -hmm. By the end of it, it was a Muslim-minority city. Um, close to half a million uh, Muslims were forced to migrate from the region, uh, and close to 237,000 Muslims were massacred in uh, Jammu city and um, to the south. These events became critical to the later dispute. Sure. Um, and um, so he asked, uh, when the stories of these massacres were kind of circulating, they were reaching Northwest Frontier Province and in other Pakistan, regions, yes. uh, the, the people from there who were called the Kabailis, yes. they started coming in in support of uh, the Muslims. Right, so this was in October 1947 when Bataan tribesmen went over into Kashmir and tried to control that territory by force. Yes, and um, some of them perhaps were uh, given directions by the Pakistani military officers, but most of them were very disorganized. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, the legends of their disorganization are pretty common in Kashmir even right. now. So they arrived in northern Kashmir, and the Maharaja, whose capital was in Srinagar, he fled the city, leaving the subjects, um, you know, undefended. undefended. Yes. And Instead, what he did was he sent a delegation to Delhi asking them to sign the instrument of accession. He wanted to sign accession with India. Um, and India said, oh, we will sign the accession and provide you military help. Uh, and the accession was based on three things. Um, that India would have control over defense, communications, and external affairs. Um, and accession itself was temporary because the Maharajas knew, Maharaja knew that most of the population was Muslim who would have wanted Kashmir to be independent, mm. you know. Right. Uh, and so he 
made it conditional that eventually when conditions are right, Kashmir people of the state would be asked their um, their will yes. and they will determine their future status. Sure. Sure. Of course that never happened. India and Pakistan went to war. Um, Kashmir was divided as you pointed out between yes. India and Pakistan. The line of control right. was drawn sure. um, through the heart, uh, heart of Kashmir yes. and since last 19, uh, you know, 73 years Kashmir has remained divided and a uh, and a dispute with, with three main parties. Absolutely, absolutely. And so um, until last year, until August of 2019, as I mentioned earlier, um, India had been governing Indian administered Kashmir uh, under Article 370, and it had sort of, again, given some semblance of autonomy to the, that Kashmiri region uh, where they were would elect local politicians, you know, and there was an, a, a, a state assembly, etc. Um, last year in August, it revoked that, um, and there was, there's been a huge communication and security lockdown, as I mentioned earlier. So what are the conditions now in Kashmir? Can you just give us an update about the security and the communications lockdown and also what is the situation? Situation as far as the humanitarian conditions are concerned? Um, since 73 years, India has been at war with the people of Kashmir. Um, it has used uh, different methods to um, suppress Kashmiri voices. Of course, um, as I said, the initial um, you know, connection between India and Kashmir was conditional that eventually there would be a right to self-determination, which was also expressed by the U UN Security Council resolutions 47 and several other resolutions. Sure. Um, but India denied the, the plebiscite, even though its leaders had publicly promised that to the people of Kashmir. Uh, second, it uh, consistently rigged elections, um, arrested leaders, even Sheikh Abdullah, who had endorsed accession with uh, India, mm -hmm. uh, a conditional accession, uh, was arrested in 1953 and put behind bars for years. Um, and since 1990, India uh, basically launched a counterinsurgency warfare in Kashmir. Uh, it may turn Kashmir into this space of exception where uh, normal rules uh, of civil liberties did not exist. Kashmiri rights could be denied any time. And from 1990 to the present, m more than uh, 85,000 people ha have been killed, um, a majority of them at the hands of Indian forces. Um, and since um, August um, the, of this year, um, that process has continued. Uh, it has uh, taken an extreme turn where um, Kashmiri freedom of expression has completely been taken away. Right. They're not allowed to use internet. And now, after seven months, they are allowed to use some internet, but not social media. Right. They've been arrests uh, of uh, you know not everyday Kashmiris, not even political activists, for using um, social media. I mean, it's a it's a really brutal regime in uh, in uh, Kashmir. Of right. course, you know on on the international stage, uh, people remember India as the land of gurus and Gandhi and whatnot. <laughs> but to Kashmir, when you look at uh, it from um, the Kashmiri perspective, uh, it's been a really um, tough state. Uh, it has acted towards Kashmiris like a colonial power, an imperial power would towards um, the colonized. Absolutely, and we'll sort of get to that part as well. Um, it seems as if now that the communications blackout is lifting very, very slowly. Um, things are getting a little bit better in that the schools are reopening, uh, businesses are reopening, and there seems to be some um, uh, sense of political activity as well that is sort of resuming in the valley, um, just and not in so much in terms of the old political guard because many of the political party's leadership still remains detained, um, but there seems to be a third political front as they're dubbing it, like there's some new political actors that are sort of coming into play. And I'm wondering if you could talk talk a little bit about that, but also in the context of, you know, how have political parties that have been operating in Kashmir, more, more, most notably the National Conference, more recently the People's Democratic Party, and others that have sought to represent Kashmir through Kashmiris through elections, how have regular Kashmiris viewed those parties and their relations with New Delhi? Yeah. Uh, so Kashmiri Politics um, is a wide spectrum. On 
uh, on one side are those parties that are called the Tehreek parties. Mm -hmm. Tehreek parties are um, multiple formations that um, basically demand right of self-determination for Kashmir. Right. Um, they have the most popularity um, in Kashmir. Um, their activists are typically in jail, yes. arrested, killed, uh, and um, they suffer immensely. Um, uh, on the in the middle, where some of these parties call that you mentioned, National Conference (PDP), these were par these have been parties who have made compromises with India. Um, to the extent where in uh, Kashmir people think that they represent Indian interests in Kashmir rather mm -hmm. than Kashmiri interests in Delhi. Uh, and But with the BJP regime, um, they even they don't be, they're not trusted. Right. So that's why some of their leadership is in the jails. Um, although these, this leadership acted like the uh, glove on the Indian bayonet mm -hmm. until very recently, they were the ones who were like helping India oppress the, their own people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, the, what you call the third front, there's not a third front really, this is like a collection of uh, assorted individuals yeah. who have uh, business interests in Kashmir and uh, are willing to play the Indian playbook, uh, you know, they're willing to throw Kashmiris under the bus and tell Kashmiris that, okay, neither the right to self-determination nor um, the possibility of full citizenship can be achieved. We can simply uh, ask for statehood, uh, you know, we get limited powers, and we must live um, as a, a subservient to Indian interests in Kashmir. Right. We cannot pursue our own interests. And of course, the BJP likes them. They would like them to uh, to be propped. Uh, and I have strong doubts that they will have any legitimacy in Kashmir. Right, right. And even yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, parties like the PDP that were recently in power, they're also sort of, you know, perceived with some level of doubt and suspicions as far as yes. the Kashmiri population is concerned. So um, since 1990, there has been a separatist movement in Kashmir. Can you talk a little bit about who makes up that movement? Because there's a wide range of groups, some of them secular, some of them religious, some of them who've resorted to violence, others who have not. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that mix of groups that makes up the separatist movement? And also, um, what do you think is going to be the future of this particular movement after you know restrictions are lifted and people are allowed to move around again um, well let me just push back against the term separatist mm -hmm. uh, Kashmiri movement has not been separatist I mean yeah, you can be separatist if you agree to the Union or if you are part of the Union uh -huh. all right uh, Kashmiris have never imagined themselves to be part of the Indian Union Kashmir had as I mentioned in the introduction had its own identity its own um, independence mm -hmm. it has lived for centuries as an independent country sure. uh, longer than both India and Pakistan have existed right. um, so uh, the the history of that movement goes back years, uh, especially since 1931, it has taken multiple forms mm -hmm. uh, from uh, emancipation from 1931 to 1947 to national self-determination or national liberation uh, from Indian occupation since 1947 onwards. Yeah. It existed in, uh, as uh, peaceful, democratic, um, mass mobilizations at different times, but at some times it has existed as under when pushed they have been, uh, it has existed at underground movement. In 1990, with uh, repress, Indian repression increasing in uh, Kashmir, uh, many young activists decided to cross over to the other side of Kashmir, which is the Azad Jum in Kashmir or uh, the Pakistani controlled side mm -hmm. of Kashmir. Um, got limited training from uh, there, came back. Of course, they were no match for the Indian military might. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, started this mass, uh, uh, you know, mobilizing. The goal was really to, uh, Kind of reduce the fear of India from Kashmir in, yeah. within the Kashmiri public sphere. Um, that has continued. Um, so the, the this national liberation movement has taken multiple forms. Yeah. Um, India has suppressed all of its different variants. Uh, of course, the armed movement has been crushed. Uh, you know, um, and they now existed. Uh, there are only probably two to three hundred of them in Kashmir right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but a majority of the movement has existed uh, in a non-armed non fashion. And those activists have been severely crushed as well. Most of them spend time in jails. Even even some who, you know, advocate Gandhian methods yes, um, yes. have been uh, put in jail. So do you have a lot of confidence in terms of where that movement is going to go, the, the non-violent, you know, movement that has been uh, for self-determination that has been going on for years? Where do you think that's going to go? Um, in the coming months? 
Um, see, uh, one can never tell where the history is moving towards, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, when you talk to Kashmiris, um, they are often, they ask, um, what is our option? Yeah. Like, I mean, the Indian state um, has basically told them that if you, you can only exist uh, as second class citizens, as subservient to the Indian interests, you cannot control your own destiny and fate. Um, so that seems like, um, uh, I mean, most Kashmiris are unwilling to live that life. Sure. You know, and you know, most uh, people around the world don't realize that there are 15 million Kashmiris around the world, including 13 million in that region, mm -hmm. uh, Kashmir and the yes. Indian side and the uh, Pakistani side. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a huge place. You know, lots of people. There are uh, kind of uh, probably a hundred other countries that have smaller populations sure. and are independent and free and relatively prosperous. Right. Kashmir has great potential. It can uh, economically develop. It uh, it has a it has a history of a tradition of progressive politics, um, but uh, being under India prevents all of that from happening. And uh, we have proof. We have the historical proof. We have tried India for years, uh, 73 years, you yes. know, and um, it has not happened. So a lot of Kashmiris believe that resistance is the only option, and uh, we you know, we have to wait for our moment. I mean, they look at the history and see like new states are forming, right. uh, you know, um, all all the time. Sure. I, you know, yes, we live in a really difficult time where a future looks really dark. You yeah. know, um, big countries are becoming belligerent, occupying. We see what is happening in Middle East, in sure. Crimea, elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, but um, I mean, you know, uh, as uh, someone said, uh, people think of think that um, the present is going to last forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's not. The present itself is a utopia. Right. So, and what do you? Uh, what is the next generation of Kashmiris? I mean, they have grown up pretty much since the National Liberation Movement began in 1990, right? So that's all that they have seen. And do you feel like they are more engaged with the resistance? Are they disillusioned with it um, uh, as they're sort of living under this kind of occupation? Um, I think that uh, in general, the sentiment is, has always been there for independence. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, Indian state has kind of like systematically alienated Kashmiris, um, or, you know, from 1947 onwards, um, denying them any political space. Uh, so it's uh, logical for Kashmiris to kind of like express sympathy, but also this they are fully aware of their history and their aspirations. Uh, and um, growing up in in the, in the in, in a place like Kashmir, you can't but uh, become. Um, cynical, mm -hmm. you know, because you see soldiers everywhere, you see repression, you see, um, you know, the ugliest form of occupation going on, you see people who've been blinded by pallets and young um, boys and girls who are taken to, to you know, interrogation centers, torture centers, and whatnot. Um, um, so, but, but having said that, there are critiques of the resistance. Not all, you know, it's uh, there's, it's not like a uniform resistance. Sure, there are different, yeah. multiple kind of visions within the resistance. Some uh, may not agree with the Islamist versions of it. Some may agree, may not agree with the liberal secular versions of right, it. Right. Um, In fact, yeah. let me sort of turn to that. You know, there are armed groups. Um, and you said that they're very limited in number now, but there are armed groups like Hezbollah Mujahideen, Jashe Muhammad, Lashkar e Tayyaba that have been involved in this movement in Indian administered Kashmir. They're all based in Pakistan and have received military training, equipment, support from the Pakistani government, the Pakistani military, however you'd like to see it. Um, and so could you speak a little bit about how local Kashmiris, and I know local Kashmiris have joined some of these groups as well, as was evidenced by the suicide bombing that happened in Pulwama last year in February, uh, where it was a local Kashmiri who had joined jesh -e muhammad and had sort of uh, become part of that. Um, but how do Kashmiris generally feel about these groups and their presence and their impact on the non-violent resistance that's going on? Um, in, while the groups may be based in Pakistan, a majority of their cadre are Kashmiri, mm -hmm. young Kashmiris from uh, mostly from rural and smaller towns. Um, as I said, the number is pretty small. You know, they are not a match for the Indian military might. Um, they, in fact, uh, they get killed as soon as they join 
um, these groups. Mm -hmm. They are poorly trained. They don't have resources. Um, it's not. It's not like Taliban, mm -hmm. you know. And Pakistani military in the 1990s was much more involved mm -hmm. um, when uh, they used to give them um, weapons, and they were like Pakistani militants and mm -hmm. Afghani militants who were involved. Yes. Um, but from 2001, Pakistani military has completely uh, kind of stepped outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at some of these younger folks who are joining these groups, they snatch weapons from police officers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, they've been overblown in the media, but okay. their actual impact, physical impact on the conflict is very little, except like when something like this blowing up of soldiers sure. happens. When something big and huge like that happens, then it does bring both countries to, to the, the brink. brink of war. Yeah. And, um, and so even though their numbers might be small, but you feel like there has been a shift in the Pakistani military's approach to these militant groups? Um, yeah, I mean, Pakistani state has, uh, I think it's a good question to ask, like the role of the Pakistani state. In the 19, early 1990s, yeah. um, the major political formation in Kashmir armed resistance was led by Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, mm -hmm. which was a mostly a secular um, pro-independence group, pro-unification yeah. group. Uh, and it, when it became popular, um, it, the Pakistani state started sponsoring pro-Pakistan groups, mm. uh, so Hezbollah Mujahideen and several other. Although Hezbollah Mujahideen was an indigenous group, yeah. um, um, but there were other groups eventually that were brought in, uh, populated mostly by Afghan and Pakistani militants. Yes. Um, which, uh, to most Kashmiris, if you ask them, did uh, although you know they had goodwill from Kashmiris, but they did more damage to the cause than help. How? Uh, How can you elaborate on that? I mean, their vision was not aligned with the aspirations of Kashmiris. Kashmiris right. wanted independence, Kashmiris wanted end to the occupation, while their goals were much more broader Islamists, which um, did not find resonance in Kashmir. Sure, um, sure. Kashmiris do not see themselves part of some global, you know, uh, caliphate and stuff. Right. And some of these groups are also perhaps perpetuating a pro-Pakistan vision, right? So yeah. calling for the merger of Kashmir with Pakistan and that also did not align with local Kashmiri sentiments. There, are, there, is, a, there is a sentiment for Pakistan in Kashmir. There are some um, uh, constituencies which are pro-Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, and for them uh, these groups would have aligned. But um, I think the polls that have been done um, by different groups yeah. uh, or the, you know, what you get, the sense you get from people is yeah. that most people would prefer independence, not be under either India or Pakistan. Sure. So um, thank you so much, Professor Junaid. We have um, sort of reached the end of our time for the first part of our discussion, so we'll conclude it here. But um, please stay tuned for part two on our discussion with Kashmir on Kashmir. Thank you so much.